Good morning, I'm Ian and today I'll be covering how to score well in H2 chemistry, a multi-prong approach that I have sort of devised uh, after studying for a H2 chemistry for two years. So Sun Tzu once said that knowing yourself and knowing your adversary will win you every battle. So I've come out uh, with a very easy way to remember what you have to keep in mind when studying for H2 chemistry. You have to know yourself, know your friend, know your enemy, and know your timeline. So I'll elaborate more about this uh, in my subsequent slides. So firstly, know yourself, how to capitalize on your natural strengths and as well as mitigate your weaknesses. So one first and most crucial aspect about yourself is your studying habits, right? So you have to ask yourself, how do I study best? Is it studying alone or with friends? Studying at home or in school? In the morning or late at night? So if you are very honest with yourself and you realize that studying in school is better for you, you are more able to focus in your school library than at home, then it may be better to study in school even if you feel very lazy to make the trip there, right? Doing so may just increase your productivity. So you have to make the decision. Alternatively, if you find that studying alone, right, uh, is better for you, better for your concentration, then you may have to leave your group of friends uh, during uh, allocated study time to go alone, maybe a uh, quiet corner in the library to study. So you need to ask yourself, is my studying habits working? If not, you may need to change it. So how? So what do you mean by, uh, is my studying habits working? So if you find yourself always distracted, right? If you find yourself always distracted, if you find yourself being unable to absorb information and studying, or you find that your productivity is low, you can't get things done, this is a good indicator that your studying habits does not suit you, right? So even though you may adopt some studying habits that your friends also adopt, like studying in a group, studying at a certain location, right? Or even studying with a certain method, right? Discussing maybe together, right? Uh, if your studying habit does not suit your own self, right? You may need to change it. So secondly, it will be mitigating your weaknesses. So your study method must capitalize on your strengths and your weaknesses, you must try to mitigate them. So what do I mean by mitigating your weaknesses? So I will share based on myself as an example. So one of my weaknesses is that I find that I easily lose motivation, especially if the topic is very dry and boring, right? Or if uh, I've already studied for many weeks and I feel that I, I get a bit lazy to study. Then uh, my mitigation is to in fact study with friends and mutually encourage one another. Because I find that being in an environment where there are other people who are also studying, right, uh, helps to encourage myself to uh, put in that additional effort because I would then think, oh, if my friends are able to do it, right, why can't I as well? My second weakness is an unable inability rather to focus on reading. So one mitigation for this is for me Whenever I read something important, to read it out loud or write it out, or write it down, write down what I read, right? Or else, uh, instead of just reading the notes alone, I do questions while reading the notes. So I have to constantly use the knowledge I'm reading to prevent myself from getting distracted. So another of my weakness is that I dislike studying certain subjects, for example, general paper, or I really hate studying for GP. So I break up this idea of studying for a GP into smaller tasks. For example, I will read five model essays first. Or I will read the school notes on the topic of uh, politics first. Right? And so after I finish each small task, I reward myself. So instead of telling myself, oh, I have to study for a GP, I feel so discouraged and irritated and just uh, frankly very upset. I instead will tell myself, okay, let me complete task one, which is related to GP. Right, it's much smaller and it seems less daunting and irritating. So same thing for you when you're studying for H2 chemistry. If you dislike studying H2 chemistry, you can say, okay, I will do 20 MCQ questions of organic chemistry, right? Or I will do three uh, long structure questions on uh, 
transition elements, right? So you break it down and you, uh, instead of saying, I have to study for H2 chemistry now, which will honestly uh, put many people off, right? Uh, you tell yourself, well, oh, I'll complete this task, chemistry task that I've set for myself. So every weakness can be transformed into a strength. For example, um, when I'm uh, not able to focus on reading, right, there's a weakness, but what is my strength? The strength is that I devise new ways to effect, to more effectively process information. So end up, I'm actually processing information much faster than many of my peers, right? Now, on to studying strategy. This is slightly different from studying habits. Studying habits is more like the kind of environment that you, in which you study. Studying strategy is more like the substance of what you are studying. Right, so which are you doing more? So I like to say that there's three core things that you have to do when studying for H2 chemistry. Right? One, two, and three. Each of them targets a certain specific skill. So the first thing is reading, normally reading your lecture notes or your tuition notes or uh, watching uh, Khan Academy videos, etc. Or even watching my videos, right, to understand the concepts. Second is to Memorize the content that you have read, right? So after you understand the concept, maybe you think, okay, let me memorize it. I mean, this is especially a very um, habit, in, in, in a way, study habit of uh, many uh, biology students, especially girls, because uh, I hypothesize that could be because that memorization is very important for uh, content-heavy subjects like biology. And the third point is, of course, to practice questions. So. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very important. And let me tell you why these three steps are very important. Okay, the first thing, reading lecture notes to understand concepts. It's important to get the textbook understanding. What I mean by textbook understanding is that if you go down the, le the uh, lesson objectives, you will say, yes, I've learned, yes, I've learned, yes, I've learned. Right? To every single lesson objective. And uh, But then that does not uh, mean that you are able to enter the exam hall. For that, you need to memorize keywords and have applicational understanding. So what do I mean by applicational understanding? I mean the ability to apply these concepts that you have just learned to what I call new scenarios. And this is very uh, common of Cambridge to do that ever since the Ministry of Education rolled out the teach less, learn more kind of concept, right? The topics you have learned has been narrowed down but instead you are tested uh, with more creative applications of the concepts. And memorization of keywords, of course, is very important. Why? Because unfortunately, like it or not, that's how uh, most school teachers mark, right? We don't actually really know how Cambridge marks, right? A lot of times, it's a mystery. But I can say that from my conversation with some teachers who themselves talk to uh, Cambridge examiners and they flew over from the United Kingdom to Singapore, Many of their marking staffs are also still very keywords based. And even if it is not keywords based, memorizing keywords will save you time in thinking of how to phrase your answer. Right? Buying you precious time to spend more time thinking about the more difficult questions. Right? So study hard, of course, but you must also study smart. So no point reading your lecture notes 10 times over without practicing any questions. Right? Because then you are you are uh, cultivating textbook understanding, maybe memorizing some keywords, but not training your applicational muscles. And also no point practicing questions without memorizing the lecture notes, right? I mean, it's not no point exactly, but it's not the best use of your time, right? Because if you just spend all your time practicing questions, sure, you know how to answer the questions, but do you know how to get marks from the question, right? That is the fundamental thing you have to ask yourself. So the thing, I'm talking now about more general things, not really uh, with respect to H2 chemistry. Definitely the uh, journey of studying for the A-levels examination is a pretty long and arduous journey. And uh, some people may find themselves discouraged, feeling depressed, feeling just not having the emotional and mental strength to continue. And that is very normal. Uh, but speaking from experience, for a healthy individual, poor emotional health, right? feeling discouraged, uh, feeling burnt out. Normally, it's usually due to unhelpful and negative thoughts and beliefs. Of course, it can also be due to physical exhaustion and mental exhaustion as well. But assuming you are pacing yourself well 
getting enough sleep, right? Not overexerting yourself, right? Then poor emotional health often is due to unhelpful and negative thoughts and beliefs. So for example, some of you may find uh, yourself uh, very jittery and anxious whenever uh, you are the exams are approaching which affects your ability to focus and concentrate on studying. Normally it's because of, of the thought that you can easily fear and that failure will be disastrous, right? Uh, some of you may feel very depressed as a result, very lethargic and just not really in the right mind, uh, frame of mind rather to study. And normally the thought is that, oh, there's no hope anymore. So even no matter how much I study, right, there's no way I'm going to score well. And that can also lead to emotions of frustration when you feel that nothing you do, right, no matter even if you put in a lot of effort, it doesn't seem to work. So very easy to feel frustrated and resentful. So this is thus the importance of thinking positively, right? The truth is no matter how much you doubt yourself, your ability to succeed is still there, right? Self-doubt cannot erode your capabilities, right? But self-doubt may result in needless anxiety and stress and you may not actively take the steps to further improve yourself because of a fear of failure or just a general feeling that, oh, uh, you're definitely not succeed, so why even bother trying, right? So on the spectrum, on one end, there's fearing the worst, right? And on the other hand, there's hoping for the best. So I think it is best to strike a balance between the two, right? Definitely, we should not uh, always fear the worst and anticipate the worst, right? Because they will simply tire ourselves out and demotivate and demoralize us. Yet at the same time, we cannot be unrealistically optimistic, right? Else we will be too disappointed when the uh, real scenario comes to pass. So it's important to have a good mix of both uh, uh, hope and also um, understanding that, you know, there could be situations where uh, things will not go as per your will. So I would like to ask all of you watching now, what is your motivation to study, right? Not just for H2 chemistry, but for A-levels in general. Is it fear, right? Are you afraid of the consequences of failing, such as not being able to get into your desired course in university, right? And the resultant implications on your career path in future. Are you also afraid of the judgment of others, right? Like how others would think of you, right? So in a sense, it's of peer pressure as well. Are you studying due to responsibility, right? You treat studying as a full-time job and that you feel that you're responsible to your parents because ultimately they paid for your educational fees. They are continually paying for educational fees. And uh, so you have to do well, right, uh, as a responsibility, and that you have to uh, get a well-paying, a decent-paying job in future in order to provide the best life for them in the future, right, when they depend on you to earn income for them. And the third uh, motivation that you possibly may have is hope, right? A belief that studying can improve your future, a confident expectation that it can improve your future, and knowing that studying now will reap results in the coming years or in the much longer term as well. So fear is usually the most effective. Like, come on, if you if you ask somebody to run, right, will a person run faster if you say that, oh, you will give him a thousand dollars if he meets a certain timing, or will he run faster if you tell him that there's a lion chasing after him? Certainly fear will be a much a stronger motivation than uh, hope, right? But fear has its uh, very uh, severe downsides as well. It's unsustainable in the long run. Sooner or later, you'll face emotional fatigue and you'll just like give up hope, right? You'll be so uh, stressed by your fear of failure that you won't be able to uh, operate normally, right? And um, yeah, and it's just not healthy for emotional well-being in the long run, right? So I think that it is best, right, to be motivated by a good mixture of responsibility and hope. Responsibility is responsibility towards others, right? And to yourself as well, but uh, towards others also. And hope is hope for yourself, right? Hope that you can achieve a better future from studying. So you also need to ask yourself what is your motivation, right? Fear cannot sustain you through the long, arduous journey of the two years of A-levels, of preparation for A-levels, right? So it's best to cultivate a positive motivation or force to study. So, once you sufficiently know yourself, you need to know your friend. So, your friend here is Cambridge International Examinations Local Examination Syndicate. 
So uh, you may not actually see Cambridge as a friend, but actually Cambridge can be your friend if you are sufficiently well prepared. Why? Because if you are well prepared, who will be giving you the marks? It will be Cambridge. Right? Who will be giving you that nice certificate at the end of the two years? You have an A, hopefully, in H2 chemistry. It will be Cambridge, right? So Cambridge can be a very important ally in this fight for your good A-level results, right? If you are well prepared, if you really did all your studying, right? You open the paper and you smile because you see all the questions you have prepared for and even those unseen questions, you can easily handle it. So then you will say thank you Cambridge, right? For giving me such an easy time, such an easy way to score well. So how do you make Cambridge your friend? You need to first be able to know Cambridge, right? Know your friend. So know how Cambridge sets questions. In other words, how do you identify common question types? In each topic, let me tell you right now that there are a couple of common question types which always reappear, each time only with minor variations. For such qualitative, which is uh, uh, when they give you a blank, right, and it's like you have to answer in words, right? Uh, such common questions, you have to memorize the keywords, memorize the answering steps. For example, trends across the periodic table, right? Uh, trends of say a group two carbonates uh, thermal stability. Right? Or uh, um, atomic size across a period. Right, for example, all these questions you realize they appear year after year after year. Right? Or even the bond strength. From F2 to, be, uh, to I2 and there's so many examples you know I even made a close to 30 page compilation of common question types right for my own use uh, in my study and it, because this question type always comes out and you simply be such a waste right if you do not get full credit out of it because literally you saw the question before almost identical you read through the answer scheme before and yet when you go to the exam you see the question at first you smile because I've seen it before then you frown because you forgot the answer right and then at the end of the exam you don't do well right you feel very upset at yourself so why why cause yourself this unnecessary distress right and for quantitative common questions right quantitative meaning it, it requires some mathematical steps right some calculations memorize the working steps for example bond Haber cycle how do you construct a bond Haber cycle right you start from the elements then you atomize them then you ionize the matter to produce electron that you electron affinity right the uh, pass the electron over to the non-metal to form the anion then you let this energy and form the ionic solid then you complete the cycle by the enthalpy change of formation of the ionic solid so uh, even if, okay, if you don't get what I was just saying means you really need to go and revise because these are very common question types right where you have to memorize the working steps right if not you really be an unnecessary waste of marks so next one, which is error carry forward, you need to know that Cambridge, right, is a very compassionate friend in that sense, right? Uh, if you cannot do part one of an answer, right, as long as you show that you're working for part two and part three are correct, right, you'll still get almost complete credit for part two and part three. So let me tell you right now that if you do a question and you do part one, right, and you realize you cannot even get an answer for part one. What do you do? Are you going to leave the whole question blank because the answer in part one is neither for parts two and three? That would be a very um, uh, like big waste of marks, right? Because you can just put any uh, random answer for part one. You can even just say if the say if they say oh a long preamble, a lot of calculations, then find the number of moles of copper to sulfate. Then you can just write number of moles of copper to sulfate equals 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 equals 0 0.2 more. Obviously, you'll get 0 for part 1. But it's okay, you can use the 0 0.2 more to solve part 2, part 3, part 4, and so on. And you can get almost full credit for all the subsequent parts. Right? Just note that try to get a write a sensible random answer for part one, right? So for example, if they if they tell if they tell you uh, if part one is uh, estimate the percentage priority, right? Say a safe answer to put will be 50%, right? Not too high, not too low. A, a really dumb answer to put will be 0.1%, right? You may end up getting some negative or some very ridiculous values for subsequent parts. Okay? So partial credit is another uh, compassionate uh, 
move by Cambridge So a bad answer is always better than no answer Why? Because there's no negative marking in the A-levels examination If you write a very long answer, right? You answer one part correctly But in the second half of your answer You essentially write something wrong Right? As long as it does not make annul the first part of your question As long as it does not make it impossible to understand Or contradict your first part of the question Even if your second part is conceptually in error They cannot minus your marks So for even for qualitative questions It seems like the most difficult to guess right? You can just make an intelligent guess for example, if they ask you will the volume increase or decrease, right? Okay, come on, you have half a chance of getting correct. So just stick to one answer, the one that you think makes the most sense, and try to support it with logical arguments. Even if you are not confident, just try to explain it. Okay? So for quantitative questions, try to use the values given to calculate something, even if you do not see how it's related to getting the answer. For example, if you are given the mass and the MR, calculate the number of moles by mass. Uh, divided by the MR, right? Uh, even if the answer is uh, something very different like percentage U or percentage priority, right? If they give you a certain value, you definitely almost always have to use that value. In fact, always for Cambridge. Cambridge, they don't normally try to distract you by giving you red herrings. Most of the time, all the values they give you are used. So try to combine some of the values together to uh, create... Um, uh, quantities that make sense, for example, mass divided by MR to, not, to give amount, right? And then uh, try to progress from there. Even if you can't progress, don't cancel your steps out, right? You may just get some partial credit. So lastly, time management exams, right? Cambridge is uh, at sometimes very generous in uh, sometimes, I'm uh, sorry, very generous in time, sometimes it can be very stingy with time, right? But they are always pretty fair. So always allocate yourself a fixed timing for each question based on the number of marks, the total marks of the paper, and the total amount of time. The recommendation is that after you divide your time properly, don't exceed the time allocated. Just skip the question first if you are unable to answer. And once you have completed the test, do go back to try to answer that question. Why? Because many students get carried away by one difficult question that they cannot solve. And the question is just at most 3 or 4 marks, right? At the most. And because of that, they miss out on doing a lot of marks of easy, a lot of easy marks at the end of the paper. So I think that is a really a very big waste, right? It's a pity. So thirdly, know your enemy. Okay, I know that many of you watching will consider chemistry an enemy, because why? You may find it very difficult, impossible to score well in, and impeding your chances into getting into your desired course in university, right? Of course, to me, chemistry has been a very good friend uh, over the years, right? Allowing me to learn a lot of things, but for you, it could be an enemy. So you need to know your enemy. So well, there's, there's this thing which uh, the famous uh, Professor Johnson once said, that there's multi-level thought in chemistry. So any person who wishes to study chemistry needs to understand chemistry from the three vertices of the triangles. The symbolic aspect of chemistry, which is how to express chemi chemicals in symbols. If I give you a vial of, a vial of silver powder, and I tell you, how does a chemist express that? I would say, AG, right? The symbol for silver. If I were to show you a piece of coal burning and ask me, how do chemists represent that? Or rather, a piece of graphite burning. Right? I would say chemists will represent it by C in the solid state. Right, or more specific graphite plus O2 in the gaseous state to give CO2 assuming complete combustion. <coughs> so this is what I mean by symbolic. Right? How to represent a chemical phenomenon or chemical substance through the use of convenient symbols that are internationally recognized. Next, microscopic. For example, if I have to ask you what is happening in the combustion of Graphite, then I would have to say microscopically if I were to zoom in all the way to the atomic level what is happening. Carbon carbon bonds are being broken, oxygen oxygen double bonds are being broken, and carbon oxygen double bonds are being formed. And then I lastly need to understand the macroscopic, for example, how much heat is released when I combust 10 grams of graphite fully. Right, that is certainly a, a pretty large, in fact, a very large number of molecules. Uh, atoms rather of graphite 
uh, of carbon in graphite and so that is on a macroscopic scale already so another example is uh, a salt is seen to dissolve right it's a macroscopic observation because the ions of the salt are able to form strong ion dipole interactions with polar water molecules so this is a microscopic rationalization of why the salt can dissolve right and it can be represented by this equation which is the symbolic level of chemistry so it is always the case that chemical phenomena in the macroscopic world right in the macroscopic world can be explained in terms of microscopic or sub-microscopic interactions right for example uh, I observed that uh, that dissolving um, a copper salt in a, a copper two salt in a solution of uh, iodide right would result in the formation of uh, cream PPT in a brown solution right so there is a macroscopic observation but I need to explain it in terms of a uh, sub microscopic level what is happening right each and every CO2 plus ion is being reduced to CO plus right and the I minus is oxidized to I2 and CO plus combines your I minus to form the cream PPT of COI uh, right and then uh, the I2 that is formed it gives the brown coloration of the solution so as uh, you probably know quite well from by now right and maybe to even to your frustration chemistry is a multi-level subject right each is like a bit like a pyramid right each uh, topic in chemistry builds up to the next builds up to the next but it's more like an inverse pyramid because the higher you go up in the hierarchy the more branches there will be maybe a bit like a tree right so at the most foundational level of chemistry chemistry is just physics right it's based on electrostatics quantum mechanics right mainly and then uh, from then on it branches out into talking about chemical bonding electronic structure and chemical bonding and electronic structure right is the gives the explanation for chemical energetics for reaction kinetics which is related to equilibria and electrochemistry uh, but i'll not go too much into this just understand from this diagram which i made myself that chemistry is an interconnected science so you cannot study chemistry in a silo you cannot just say okay today i'll just study this then i'll study that in fact, it's impossible to do that because once you open up your, even if you buy a topical 10 year series and you try to open it up and do, you realize that each question actually cannot be divided into really a topical level. Why? Because many questions require multi level understanding. Okay? Multi level understanding. Understanding of various topics, combining together to get a holistic understanding of a chemical phenomenon. So these are the topics you will encounter in H2 chemistry. The foundational topics are stoichiometry and redox, atomic structure and chemical bonding. Right, you must master this in JC1. If not, you will have trouble when you come to JC2. These topics in red over here, they are very big topics, right? They are very big topics and they are almost always tested with high weightage. I group all the organic chemistry topics together because it's always tested as if they are one giant topic, right? For example, part A, they give you a compound in many functional groups, right? many functional groups that uh, lie across the topics right and then uh, they ask you questions about it involving the various functional groups then lastly they ask you to uh, maybe a structural elucidation question where a substance x is subjected to various tests and this test is a uh, come is to detect right uh, functional groups from uh, across the uh, many topics of organic chemistry and the green topics they are what i call more minor topics right and more standalone topics normally uh, they are not really uh, that tested uh, together with the other topics. I mean, they can appear in the same question, but normally the part which tests on the topics in green will be fair, quite standalone, right? Can stand alone on itself without the other parts of the question. So, but not to say that they are not important, right? You definitely need to study them still. So, chemistry is actually all about logical arguments. What do I mean? Let us take a look at these two different answers to the same question explain why electronegativity increases across a period. Let me look at the first answer right now as if I'm marking it as a marker. Okay, across a period, electrostatic attraction between nucleus and valence electron increases. 
right? So I think what the student is saying is that hey, remember that electrostatic attraction increases, right? So okay, that is correct. As the number of electrons increases and the number of protons increases, but the number of shafts remain the same, then you realize that I I probably now have a very constipated look on my face, right? Because I want to sympathize with this student because certainly he has studied his content, right? He's throwing me all the keywords. So yes, he did memorize his keywords, oh yes. But I have a very constipated look on my face because I cannot give him any marks, right? My marks cannot come out. That's why I'm feeling constipated. Why cannot I come out any marks for him? Because his argument does not make sense. He does not show the logical link between the electrostatic attraction increasing to the number of electrons increasing and and, and what is this but the number of shell remains the same I know from the word but that this is a qualifier but what is it qualifying right so I am very confused so I, I, I would struggle to give him a mark right but look over here for a more logical argument right so uh, let me annotate it in green across the period number of protons increases has nuclear charge increases right we see this logical because each proton is positively charged and is in the nuclear so increase in number of proton increases nuclear charge okay Number of electrons also increases, okay? But as these electrons are added to the same outermost shell, shielding effect remains approximately constant. Hence, combining these two effects, the increase in nuclear charge and the approximately same shielding effect, right? We draw the conclusion from these two tenets that effective nuclear charge increases. So what does this mean? Effective nuclear charge increases because the nucleus is positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. The electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the bonding electrons increases. And because electronegativity is a measure of the attraction an atom has for a bonding pair of electrons, right? Electronegativity increases. So I say I can give him the mark, right? 2 out of 2 or 3 out of 3, right? Because this is logical. So that's why, right, you cannot just memorize keywords. And that brings me to the next point, which is the importance of the studying strategy, right? Firstly, you must master conceptual understanding. Imagine if a student goes into the exam hall, right? Say it's an organic chemistry test, and he doesn't even know what skeletal structure means. He doesn't even know how to draw skeletal structures. He doesn't know what alcohol means. Like certainly, right? He can't even do a single question. So conceptual understanding is the foundation. Then you need to possess, actively claim for yourself, the applicational understanding. Why? Because applicational understanding allows you to logically approach novel question. How do you possess this applicational understanding? There's no two ways about it. You have to do practice to expose yourself to more different questions and from there, draw the logical uh, links from yourself and derive a true applicational understanding of the topic. Lastly, I advise you to do this just before the exam. Memorize keywords so that to get you the marks you deserve. So you don't encounter a scenario that you know how to answer the question, you answer the question, but because you did not hit the keywords, you are being denied the marks, right? That would be very uh, sad and your feel is very unfair and I agree with you, it's, it's, it's not fair, right? So, but there's no th nothing you can do about it except to memorize the keywords in advance to ensure that you get treated fairly by the examiners. So for each topic, what I advise you to do is to first attend the lecture, complete the tutorial, open book, do topical revision open book. So this is for students who are not so confident at first. Then when you're more confident, do the topical revision closed book. Then lastly, before the subject test or something, or just at the end and you feel that you have uh, sufficiently understood the topic, you can collate all the definitions and the keywords that you need to uh, learn in the question. And also the answering methods to commonly uh, repeated questions and memorize them. So why do I ask you to do open book first? Because this will prevent you wasting too much time when you try to do questions without really understanding the topic. It also means that you can do questions and reread the lecture notes as you do the questions, right? Killing two birds with one stone. So before the exam, what I advise is that you do closed book topical practice first, right? Why closed book? Or at most, just do a quick skim of the lecture notes one more time to uh, revise your knowledge. Then you close book and do topical practice. Right? Because by now you should have a sufficient grasp of the concept, you just need to bring some things to the surface of your memory, right? Next, memorize definition and keywords and practice past year papers, noting the time limit, right? And trying to adhere to a time limit. You don't have to do that 100% strictly, 
but just don't take your own sweet time do it halfway make a coffee then do some more right no uh, you should keep an eye on the time so lastly is know your timeline which is keeping track of your time and knowing what to do at each stage so this is approximately the timeline for H2 chemistry so the first uh, bar would be JC1, the second bar would be JC2. So for the first bar, right, uh, here is orientation. You pretty much can't do things. You just let your brain rot, right? Uh, continue rotting, right? Uh, uh, which it has probably been ever since your uh, IP final examination or your O levels, right? So, uh, but after that, you need to quickly kick into full gear, right? There's not much time to waste. Why? Because all this, right, of all this, one, two, three foundational topics and two topics that are very major topics already, right? And then, uh, so you definitely have to make use of your first uh, uh, first June break. You cannot game too much. You cannot uh, be too involved in your CCA. I know difficult as that sounds. At the same time, you also cannot waste too much time on project work, right? Ultimately, project work is a H1. Chemistry for most of you will be a H2. So you should go into CT1 uh, hopefully getting a decent grade, a C or uh, even a B. And then uh, after that, you uh, dive straight into chemical equilibrium or getting chemistry. At the same time as you practice this, uh, do spend some time practicing the previous topics that we've already covered, right? Especially in your run-up to your promos, your revision period, right? Your promos is important, why? Because uh, most of you would wish to promote, right? You don't wish to waste too much time, right? By repeating a JC1. Even though I must reiterate that it's not a disastrous thing if you have to uh, retain. Why? Because normally, if you, are, you only retain if uh, you score pretty badly for promotion exams. And let me tell you that the promotion exams are usually set at a standard that is way lower than the prelims and lower than the A-level examination. So if you're not doing well, um, normally uh, you, can only, uh, you cannot blame the um, question paper. Most schools don't set very difficult promotional exams on H2 chemistry. So uh, what you, uh, if you uh, so you definitely don't want to uh, retain, right? Because that is just uh, wasting your time. Uh, but obviously, if you retain, uh, just take it as a, another opportunity, right? Be positive about it to uh, go back, uh, try again, uh, study harder this time, study more smartly this time, right? And seek help from your teachers and your peers, and then hopefully uh, do well in the A levels eventually, right? Even though you're slower, right? But slower and steady can lead you to the destination in good time as well. And then JC2, uh, you may think that, okay, I can only, I can afford to delay studying until uh, this, uh, until my holidays. However, that is unfortunately not true because why you are hit with very, with the rest of organic chemistry, which is actually the more difficult parts of organic chemistry. And before you even have time to process about organic chemistry, you are hit with more topics. And of course, your CT1. Then, uh, so you definitely need to practice along the way, right? I advise after organic chemistry, start drilling organic chemistry questions already. Because organic chemistry, especially to physics and math students, right, is a new experience, right? You need to actually start memorizing some stuff, right? And you need to answer a lot of quali uh, qualitative right, writing questions, right? That some of you physics students out there may not, including me, right, I'm a physics student, may not be that familiar with. So, yeah, you definitely need to start practicing. And then definitely do a revision for CT2. And actually, you can start doing a uh, A-level 10-year series, right? Because it's only one topic left, which is transition elements that, if I'm not wrong, in this year, 2020, is being removed from the A-level examination, right? Due to the disruption of COVID-19. But anyways, you should definitely start doing a, a TYS, right? I advise, right? Even at the start of your holidays, right? In preparation for CT2. Because normally, CT2 will only exclude, like, at most three or four topics, right? Then you should continue your revision all the way to prelims. And after prelims, right, do not slack off. Even if you have scored well, do not slack off, right? Why? Because there's still a big chunk of the of the of the uh, time before the A levels. Your peers can catch up with you. And remember, this is all greater in a bell curve, right? Don't be too competitive, of course. Help your friends out. But the fact is, the rest of the nation will be continuing to study if you slack off, right? You slacking off won't won't affect them. They continue to study, right? And then your position on the bell curve will become more and more uh, uncertain, right? So you definitely want to continue studying throughout the revision time period. Finally, reach your A-levels and give it your best shot. So for all those JC2 students out there, there is sufficient time for you, right? You may not feel that way, but there is sufficient time for you. 
many students have made a U-turn in their grades from prelims to A-levels. Why? Because there is approximately, and when I say U-turn, I mean literally a U-turn. Means get jumping from a U, right, to a B in the A-levels, right? Okay, partly it's due to the increased difficulty of the prelims relative to the A-levels. But most importantly is the fact that they really put in the best effort after their prelims to study and also consult their peers, their friends, sign up for tuition, sign up for crash courses, intensive drilling sessions, whatever. They really put in their effort, really spent a lot of time, energy and effort into transforming their results. And they uh, managed to taste the uh, sweet uh, returns to their endeavors. And make good use of this time to consolidate your understanding. There's sufficient time to study if you put in consistent effort throughout the year, right? Of course, if you want to avoid having the very draining, emotionally draining, stressful, uh, just absolutely uh, awful time between prelims and a level spending almost every waking hour studying, right? If you want to avoid that, put in consistent effort throughout JC1 and JC2. Trust me, it is worth it. Okay, one last thing I want to share with you is to sort out your priorities. So it is very important, of course, to have activities that you enjoy and which allow you to de-stress, right? Be it your sports CCA, playing computer games, uh, watching YouTube videos, uh, just scrolling through Instagram, uh, whatever, right? Uh, it's important to have such activities, definitely. But especially for things like CCA, like external uh, uh, hobbies and uh, what, what not, right? Uh, those that take up pretty much a lot of your time, right? Ask yourself, you are spending too much time, right? Because time is a resource, you know, it's, it's a scarce resource, right? As economic students would say, I'm an economic student myself. So do your cost benefit analysis, right? For all the econ students out there, do your cost benefit analysis, okay? Be a rational student, okay? So on improving your portfolio, okay, some of you may say that, oh, but, 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 but I am doing my CCA, I'm participating in the prefectoral board, the prefectoral council, I am doing this, I'm doing that, to improve my portfolio, so that I can better get a job, uh, uh, sorry, a university that I want, a university course that I want, to better get a scholarship. Yeah, but granted, it does not affect your grades, right? Because A-level results matter most for admission to local universities, and in fact, uh, to most universities around the world, they'll look at your final examinations and for us, it is the A-levels examination. So in other words, what does it mean? You can get into the course you desire with grades and no CCA achievements. You can, through the normal admission route. But it is much harder if your CCA achievements are fall short of the grade because then you have to apply through the discretionary admissions route and there are much fewer seats reserved for the discretionary admission route. right? And most scholarships, right, if you're talking about scholarships, only consider students with close to or exactly 90 rank points. So grades are always considered before extracurricular achievements. Grades are always the primary consideration factor. So definitely make sure that you're making the right informed choice, right? If right now you are struggling uh, and failing in some subjects, certainly you should not be spending too much time on, say, your music performance, your sports CCA or your uh, prefectoral council or whatever, certainly you should not be wasting too much time if you are really struggling and failing in some subjects, right? And even if, right, you are not really failing but you are still not scoring at least straight Bs, right, you really need to reconsider whether you, you really want to gun for a beautiful portfolio but yet not a, a straight A result because honestly a straight A result open more doors than a good portfolio. Now, lastly, I'd like to uh, say some few things to uh, fellow, uh, to, our, to my juniors, right, studying for the A-levels, uh, fellow comrades who, have, uh, who are retaking A-levels, right, fellow peers, and even seniors who are considering retaking their A-levels, right, to those feeling demoralized, right, it's easy to feel frustrated when you see smarter friends study less but still score better. But just a word for you is that the harder, the better, the sweeter will be the victory. Okay, so even though you may feel that you're putting so much more effort by yielding so uh, so much less results than some of your peers, right? Some of your peers are not naturally gifted, right? Study a bit, well, can score very well already, right? But remember, at the end of the day, when both of you hold the certificate with the same results, or even if you hold a certificate with scores slightly less than, 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 than your smart friend, you still have more to be proud of, okay? There's more reason for you to be glad of your results, more reason for you to rejoice, more reason for you to reward yourself at the end of the day, right? Success will be sweeter. To those feeling stressed, right, it's a mistake to tie your sense of self-worth to your academic performance. So I know many students out there think that, oh, 
I mean, if I don't score well, then what what kind of a student am I, right? But no, that's a mistake actually. And just thinking that way will just cause you to feel very depressed if you don't score well. Even if you're managing fine, you feel anxious, right? Because what if, right? I I I mess up, right? What 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 happened to me, right? So it's a mistake to tie your sense of self of your academic performance, right? Even if you do not do well in the A levels, rest assured that there's many, many other routes, right? Routes to university, routes to a good career, routes to a well-paying job, right? Especially in uh today's Singapore, definitely much better than in our parents' time, in our grandparents' time, right? And with with that being said, though, I'm sure that with the hard work you have put in, you will definitely do great. So do have some confidence in yourself, because remember, you doubting yourself does not negate your capabilities. If you study hard, even if you leave the exam with a lot of fearfulness, if you study hard, you knew what you were doing. You still score well. It's just whether you want to live your days in fear before getting your A level cert, or live your days knowing that you try your best and the things will probably go well for you. Okay, that that's your choice. It's just whether you want to uh, make yourself like very anxious and apprehensive, or whether you are just going to relax and have some confidence in yourself. So my closing remarks for all of you guys will be to definitely try your best, try your best in what you are doing, so as not to leave any regrets. This exam is important. I'm not one to negate the importance of the A level exam by saying, "Oh, grades don't matter." No, grades do matter, right? Grades still matter. They don't matter as much. They do not determine who you are as a person. They will not make or break your life, definitely in no way. But it's still important. Why? Because it. Uh, scoring well in the A levels can smoothen your path to university and smoothen your career path significantly. So really, well, there's no need to be overly anxious about it. There's no need to treat it as if it's your entire life, as if life and death depends on it. Obviously, not that'll be foolish. But still, give it your best shot. Okay, try your best in preparation for the A level, so that when you turn around few years down the road, when you're in university, you don't say, "Oh, I wish I had." Try harder, score better. Maybe I would have been in that course that I wanted to go in and study. The course that I was actually interested in, but which I failed to get in because I just didn't try hard enough for my A levels. Right? Yeah. So just don't leave yourself any regrets. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for watching through this rather lengthy video, and I hope that the rest of the year will be very smooth for you. Right, that you will achieve great progress, great breakthrough in your results, and you eventually get something that you can be proud of. Right, irrespective of your results, I hope that you can be proud of this journey that you have traveled. Thank you.